You're muted. Sorry. So hello. Um, welcome to um, our Open Classroom. I'm at Open Classroom uh, from Margin to Center, remembering Bell Hooks. Um, so I, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, and uh, would you like to say hello? Uh, yes, I will say uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, sabah al khair. مساء النور مساء الخير للجميع اللي مجتمعين معنا ومنرحب فيكم بوينس تاردز بوينس دياس بوينس تاردز بوينس نوتشز فور ايفريبادي هوز جوينينج اس اي تيرن ات باك تو يو ماي كوليك بروفيسور كونيكاوا سو وي ديلايك تو ستار ويت لاند اكنولجمنت اند اي دو ذات هير ان ذا باي اريا اند دكتور عبد الرحادي ويل دو ذات اون ذا ايست كوست سو Uh, um, the campuses of San Francisco State University on the San Francisco Peninsula and North Bay area, um, are, North Bay, are located within the occupied territories of the uh, Lamaitash Ohlone and the coastal Miwok. Um, Dr. Jahadi? Yes, and I'm I'm uh, I'm currently on the east coast of the United States, which is the land of the displaced Lenabi people. Uh, I also want to welcome our colleagues from Palestine, the indigenous lands of Palestine, and to welcome everybody who's joining us from around the world. And also give a shout out to everybody who has fallen in the struggle for justice, for freedom, for liberation for all. Um, so we'd like to uh, express our gratitude and appreciation for um, all our esteemed panelists who accepted our invitation um, and responded to um, your feedback on reading and uh, audio, audiovisual pedagogical material. And uh, we are really looking forward to um, our discussion today. And so thank you. And uh, we'd also like to uh, express our gratitude to um, um, those who helped us to make this uh, open class impossible. Dr. Abdurhadi, would you like to do that? Uh, sure, I will. Uh, in addition, I want to thank Lais Ghuloum, uh, who is an MA graduate student in ethnic studies and Ahmed studies for their essential role throughout the process not only drafting the flyer on the publicity, setting up the stream yard and being in the back room, helping out and so on, but also Leith has also participated in conceptualizing the program, in uh, drafting the process and for their thoughts and ideas. We also want to thank Salim Shahade, who is a doctoral uh, student in U at UCLA in anthropology and uh, Ahmed MA, who has been providing also behind the scenes support on StreamYard as, as uh, elsewhere. As they make their transition to Palestine, you will be seeing them both soon, Amira and uh, Samah, uh, to work on their field research on Palestinian student activism. Without Leith and uh, Salim's support, we would not have been able to do this because we're really acting on volunteer, well, volunteer and paid labor, let's call it this way. And uh, I will turn it over to you, Professor Tumomi, to speak about the course concepts. Okay. So we are privileged to have um, several co-sponsors for this um, open classroom. Um, so along with um, Ahmed studies at SFSU, um, Anajah National University, and uh, Nablus Palestine, um, uh, with whom SFSU has the only um, MOU with any Arab or Muslim site around the world, um, and they are joining us today. And then um, Institute of Women's Studies at Birzeh University, Birzeh, Palestine. Um, also Women's and Gender Studies Program at Southern Connecticut State University. Um, Women's Research and Resource Center and Department of Women's Studies at Spelman College. Um, and also Women and Gender Studies Department at SFSU. Um, so thank you. And also um, there are uh, three classes. Um, students from our classes are joining today, so I'd like to welcome them. Um, the, the, my class is Women and Gender in U.S. History and Society, WGS 150. And um, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Abdurhadi uh, had three classes. Um, and um, 
those are introduction to Arab and uh, Arab American feminisms, uh, colonialism, imperialism, and resistance, and then a uh, course on Palestine. Um, So next, we would like to uh, talk about why the event, introduce the event, why did we do the event, and try to contextualize how we, the two of us, came about and to frame it. Uh, why the event and why we're doing something on teaching Palestine? Why open classrooms to start with? Uh, how this event uh, came about? Part of it has to do with the immediate passing of bell hooks. We couldn't actually do events around the immediate passing of Nawal Sadawi or Etel Adnan or many others who have passed. Uh, sometimes the timing was really problematic. So we want to just make sure that while we want to honor and uh, say that really Bell Hooks was a very, very important figure and continues to be, there are many other people who passed away, uh, men, women, and gender non-binary folks who we also would like to be able to honor and to think about it in the spirit of collective production of knowledge and collective coming together and teaching us what, what, uh, what we have. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to, uh, and also it's been really difficult for us to plan this during the winter break and the various uh, tri tri trials and tribulations that we have uh, gone through. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Professor Kinakawa to speak about uh, their own uh, connection with this particular event, and then I will speak and then we will move to introduce our uh, esteemed panel. Thank you. So I'll just briefly um share my personal um connection to the uh, this panel and panelists um so i identify myself as a queer scholar activist with um danish korean and japanese ancestries and um i'm currently teaching in um the, at sfsu um my introduction to bell Fuchs work um if i i remember it correctly was uh, her teaching to transgress education as the practice of freedom um i read it and reread it over the years and uh, taught it on multiple campuses in my earliest academic career. Um, however, I, I had to wait until a little bit later in my career um, for my deeper appreciation and understanding of Belafix's work along with other Black feminist and queer studies authors. Um, it was in 2009 when I had a privilege to attend um, Spellman uh, and WSA National Women's Studies Association Summer Institute um, that uh, Dr. Vivari Guy Setfor and Dr. Tricia Lin, along with their colleagues and guests, organized and offered um, uh, for um, the, offered the Institute for Junior Feminist Faculty Members of Color at the time. Um, and that institute really um, transformed my understanding of feminism and uh, helped me realize serious limit limitation of my understanding at the time. And um, I vividly remember that the organizers challenged me to realize how crucial Black feminist thoughts, including the notion of intersectionality, are for our analysis of global configuration of racial and gender power. And for the first time, I started to understand how fundamental Black feminist thoughts, along with work by Indigenous and other feminists of color, are for my critique of Asian settler colonialism in general, but also Japanese imperialism, colonialism in particular. And so after the Institute, um, Bill Fuchs' notion of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy, and I would say cis heteropatriarchy garnered a completely new meaning for my work and my understanding of transnational feminism. And uh, over the years after the Institute, I devoured Black feminist thoughts and queer transgender of color critique in the really new light. And I reread Kombahi River collective statements and Dr. Margot Okazo Ray's work in that context. And then also in that context, I started to read Dr. Rabab Abdul Hadi's work on pal Palestine and Arab and Arab American feminism. And um, I started, um, and then her notion of indivisibility of, of justice. Um, and I think, I, I think it, one of her co-authors, Dr. Dana Owen, was also a participant of the Summer Institute. Um, and so, um, and then in spring 2020, I invited Dr. Rabab Abdurhadi to guest lecture in my um, WGS 50. And then um, Dr. Abdurhadi gracefully accepted my invitation and then in turn invited me to co organize Ahmed Open Classrooms. Um, and I was introduced to this the innovative, um, innovative Ahmed critical pedagogy. Um, and 
um, it, it's both my students and myself got in, uh, introduced to that. Um, and so that over the four semesters, I got to co-organize a series of eight open classrooms on gender and sexual justice in Palestine and Arab Muslim communities with Dr. Abdul Hadi. And so this current open classroom from Merge, I mean, this one in particular allows me to come full circle personally, but I, I'm imagining, I'm also imagining that it is true for many others like myself who have benefit, benefited from definitive work that our distinguished panelists have gifted us during past decades and the connections and bridges that they have forged among themselves and all of us through their work in solidarity based on the critical conceptualization of intersectionality, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy, and individuality of justice. So I'd like to hand this to Dr. Abdul Hadi. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh... Kinakawa, it's, it's really been a, such an honor and a privilege to work together uh, in the academic trenches and in the intellectual trenches and outside of them, uh, connecting and basically dissolving the walls of the, of the, of the classroom. Uh, I will uh, just speak a, a briefly about uh, what brings me here and my connection. Uh, well, of course, the whole question of the teaching Palestine, pedagogical practice and the indivisibility of justice where we um, actually had collaboration with Birzeit University, Edwin and Najah National University in 2018 with conferences. I have uh, had uh, the privilege to be to know both uh, Dr. Saleh and Dr. Uh, Silmi in various ways, in many, many uh, other spaces in, in, uh, in the Palestinian feminist movement, in Palestinian feminist uh, um, circles, and in, in terms of Palestinian justice and struggle for justice for all as well. Uh, I have been, I, I, I'm a very late comer to the academy. I was actually an activist for a long time, community organizer. And then I came to the uh, classroom back in 1992 and in my uh, women's studies courses at Hunter College in New York, I read Bell Hooks, but I also heard about her through my organizing and speaking with other feminists around the country in different places. Uh, there has been a lot of influence obviously on my own thought and my own work I mean, in my own intellectual development of black feminist thought, uh, indigenous uh, feminism, uh, uh, color feminism. I um, have been, I mean, the whole question that Margot Okazawa, uh, will, Ray will be joining us, she always speaks about how we stand on the shoulders of others. And we do stand on the shoulders of others. And it's really important to kind of like acknowledge that. I met Bell Hooks in 2014 at the National Women's Studies Association Conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, this was this was a conference that was very very memorable at NWSA because of its support for Palestine publicly. Uh, part of it had to do with the context that we were in Puerto Rico. It was a, another site of anti-colonial uh, liberation movement that is occupied by settler colonialism uh, because of uh, Puerto Rican feminist and queer support for Palestine who were very strongly involved in the conference. There was also a very large collective of uh, uh, participants in NWSA that have gathered 800 signatures in less than 24 hours to support Palestine. And also, I would just say uh, there are other factors, including the, the indigenous and women of color feminist delegation to Palestine in 2011 that uh, we have actually assigned one of the articles on it and uh, in which uh, um, Beverly Gishaftal was a participant. And uh, there was a panel at NWSA in 2014 organized by Chandra Talpa de Mohanty, who was a member of the delegation with several participants from the delegation and uh, others, including uh, the uh, current, uh, the former director of the Institute for Women's Studies at Birzeit University and the former executive director of Jewish Voice for Peace and Angela Davis to discuss Palestine. But, uh, and then during that panel, we actually asked a question about when when can NWSA actually come out publicly to speak about Palestine? Now, there has been very many factors in National Women's Studies Association earlier. Uh, for example, one of the, for, uh, the, the, the phenomena that I kind of call the browning of National Women's Studies Association, of which Beverly Gishaftal has been a leading force and has been, and I should say that I've also had the honor to meet uh, Beverly and, uh, and uh, through a classroom also, um, uh, she and uh, Chandra Mohanty taught in Atlanta to, in, to, in during the future of minority studies uh, reception through many many other ways. But also Trisha Lynn, 
who was the president of NWSA at that time, had, had invited uh, Palestine to speak at the presidential panel first time in 2013. This was the first time Palestine actually moved from the margin to the center. It's been, there has always been activities at NWSA, but this was actually acknowledgement. And that, uh, along with the browning of NWSA, and, and it's not accidental, none of these things are accidental, comes together. So uh, uh, Trisha invited uh, Bell Hooks to speak at the conference, and uh, she was a keynote speaker. And I remember I stood up in the, the, the keynote and I said, do you, do you think that NWSA should support Palestine and BDS? And Bill Hooks said 100%. And that was the whole question that we raised to the panel. And uh, at that time, also Trisha played a very leading role in the sense that she asked the body, what's your sense of the body on this? 2,000 people at least and stood and clapped for Palestine. And Trisha said the membership has spoken. Now, due to uh, technical and bureaucratic issues, NWSA could not pass a resolution then at that time, but there was a statement that was published. And then there were plans that we started, created Feminists for Justice in for Palestine. And we proposed the vote in the Milwaukee conference of NWSA in 2015. The, pass, the vote passed for over 60%. It has been uh, attacked again and again. And so we, uh, this is kind of like part of the history of where some of these intersections come in. And why is it that we have the guests that we have here. So we invited participation of colleagues from our own institution, Dr. Adriana Clay, who is the chair of the Department of Sociology and Sexuality Studies, and other institutions across the US with whom we work closely, and who Bell Hooks and her work have had particular connection to, as well as the teaching Palestine, such as Dr. Trisha Lynn, Dr. Beverly T. Sheftal, Dr. Margot uh, Okawazare, to participate and have a conversation with colleagues at Palestinian Women and Gender Studies. We were so thrilled when both al Najah National University and Birzeit University responded. And we, ha we were joined by Professor Samah Saleh and Professor Amira Silmi in joining this round table that pays tribute to Bell Hooks, remembers her life and work and discusses her, uh, her influence. We do not expect, I should say, nor do we seek conclusions but we, there, we rather engage, we want to engage in much needed transnational conversation that continues these critical engagements and pushes the envelope further on the production of knowledge. What does it mean? Who owns it? What does it mean to please justice at the center of our scholarship, teaching and service? And how do we deal with it? Our esteemed panelists reflects this rich praxis. Uh, so we cannot cover everything in this short panel. But uh, we will, uh, we, and we cannot talk about all the bios because this is very, very rich. But what we will do, we are going to be posting uh, edited, I mean, draft bios on, on, on the Facebook now for people to know, to learn about uh, Professor Amira Silmi, Andriana Clay, Beverly Gishiftal, Margot Akawaza, Reyes, Samah Saleh, and uh, Trisha Lynn. And the way we are going to do it, we're going to have three rounds of discussions. The first one will be about uh, discussion and explanation. And the second one will be like about uh, 20 minutes. The second round will be, um, the, so the first one will be about introduction. The second one will be, why did you say our colleagues gave us selected readings and video, audiovisual material to start with? And we invite everybody to add and fulfill. Why did you select these readings? What are your thoughts and critiques? And the third round is, is it important to teach bell hooks? Why and how? How does teaching bell hooks link to other curriculum we select for our classroom? How do our students respond to the material? And then we will end with questions and answers again for uh, um, 15 minutes and closure. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, to Momi Kinakawa, to start the first round and um, uh, pose the first uh, set of the question and we'll meet our esteemed panelists. And surprisingly, we're actually right on time. So. Professor Kinakawa. Um, uh, we're asking the other panelists to introduce themselves and um, also um, talk about how they became acquainted with Bell Hooks. And so um, we'd like to um, start with, um, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm just checking the order. Uh, so I, we'd like to start with Dr. Vivri Gashepto. Um, and Dr. Gash um, Chef Talk, thank you. Thank you. L let me let me first of all say how happy I am to to uh, uh, be a part of this Teaching Palestine Open Classroom, and I want to uh, thank Rabab first of all 
for the amazing um, 2011 Women of Color and Indigenous Women trip to Palestine, which had a huge uh, impact on my intellectual and political life. And I want to also thank Trish, who was vice president when I was president of NWSA. And so let, 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 let me begin. Uh, Rabab mentioned the browning of NWSA, and I like that phrase very much. So I want to go back to uh, an earlier browning of NWSA, because that's where Bell Hooks comes in. But before I do that, I always want to say that I am a child of the civil rights movement. I was born in the Jim and Jane Crow, deep south of Memphis, Tennessee. A march with Martin Luther King Jr. was at Spelman College doing the student sit-ins. And so I, I always want to, to acknowledge that. You're going to hear uh, National Women's Studies Association in this narrative, and Rabab has also alluded to NWSA. I met Bell Hooks in 1981. Bell Hooks was uh, six years younger than me. She was not Bell Hooks then. She was Gloria Watkins. This was the third annual National Women's Studies Association in Storrs, Connecticut, when we met on college campuses and lived in dormitories. Bell Hooks actually came to NWSA promoting her first book, uh, Ain't Our Woman, Black Women and Feminism. And when I share this with my students, they can't believe it. She had no resources and she did not even have a place to stay. Before I mention that, I want to say that this was a historic National Women's Studies Conference. The theme was um, Women Respond to Racism. Audre Lorde was the keynote speaker. Barbara Smith from Combahee River Collective, which Mar Margo will talk about, was one of the persons who was there. Sweet Honey and the Rock sang. Uh, Viney Burroughs did a one-woman show. And so it was an amazing, an amazing gathering. And I would say, Rabob, the beginning of the browning of NWSA, though not to the same extent that happened later. But anyway, Gloria Watkins Bell was literally walking around and I literally bumped into her. And she had her book and she was promoting her book. And I said, where are you staying? And she said, I don't have anywhere to stay. I said, well, you can stay in my dormitory room. And so Bell Hooks brought her little stuff to my dormitory room. And she and I literally talked all night. And we talked for 40 years until she died in December of this year. So that was how I met Bell Hooks, Gloria Watkins. Oh, that was also the other thing I want to mention. 1981 is extremely important. That's the year that I started the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College, same year, 1981. And, and, and Belle was one of the most frequent visitors. And most of the time she came with no honorarium. So that's my um, little story about Belle, Gloria. And uh, we were going to go. Thank you so much, Beverly. And it's also, this is kind of like emphasizes how important the oral history. We've been talking about that multiple times and so on. So this is also part of these projects that we really, really need to do. Uh, we are going to go next. We were going to go next to Professor Margo Okazawa, Okawazare, but uh, actually she got the time uh, uh, mixed up, but she's going to be joining us. So how about we go to you, Professor Trisha Lynn, next and allow uh, Professor Margo to just have a breathing moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rob Bob and Tomomi for your invitation. I, I want to echo Beverly to say that this is a, a extreme, extraordinary moment in terms of a trans, transnational feminist um, solidarity work. Um, and I bring you greetings um, from the land of the Pocasset and the Quinnipiac people. And a 17th generation daughter of Taiwan, I was not given any uh, feminist uh, in ingredient or nutrition. Uh, in fact, if anything, I think it was hidden away from me uh, very, very carefully. So I was very carefully taught to stay away from it. The, the fact that I got to read Bell Hooks, the fact that I got to read Beverly Guy Shefto, Angela Davis, um, Maxine Hong Kingston, Joey Kogawa, I mean, the, uh, the, 
radical women uh, feminists of color. You know, it's really incredible thinking about that journey. So today I um, I am joining many of my sisters in radical mourning after the passing, the physical passing of um, of uh, Gloria J. Watkin, um, bell hooks. But I think in so many ways she um, lives on very much like uh, Tomomi's narrative. I read Bell Hooks. Um, I watch Bell Hooks actually. Um, you know, she, she she was interviewed. And, you know, they're actually. Uh, you know, you could unlike a lot of academics. You know, it was quite easy to access her voice, her sound. But um, I need to say that it was not really taught systemically. But I personally did not meet uh, Bell until um, the conference of uh, NWSA in Puerto Rico, 2014. The very memorable, one of the very memorable uh, NWSAs. Um, and um, I will just say that um, in so many ways, uh, meeting Bell in person um, finally getting to know this incredible big heart, uh, this person personifying love, you know, sort of uh, like you see, this is exactly what um, I have been encountering in her words. Um, so I would just say that it, it's been, and since uh, NWSA 2014, I've had a few other encounters uh, with Bell. Um, and it, it's, I would just say extraordinary to get to know. You always, you can always read the person, hear the person, but you don't always get to know the person. And it's been an extraordinary privilege to be able to do that. And I will mention this, that, um, um, right after Bell's keynote uh, at NWSA 2014, I hosted a little gathering in my um, my hotel room. Um, it was a whole suite. Um, I want to say that it was incredible. Bell got there very, very uh, late. By the time she got there, um, we had party probably for almost 45 minutes. Uh, lots of food was gone. She was kept behind because there were, you know, uh, a lot of people wanted to talk to her. And she arrived a bit late and she continued to engage everyone. And her giving of her uh, energy in, in sort of uh, reaching out to folks is just extraordinary. So I'll stop here to say, um, I'm just so glad, uh, Rabab, uh, Tomomi, you're kicking off this whole year of a radical morning and remembering bell hooks. Thank you, Professor Lin. I think next we're going to, we were going to, uh, uh, Professor Okawazari is joining us, but uh, she's having technical difficulties. So we were wondering, uh, the, uh, Professor Clay, if you don't mind going next while uh, Professor Okawazari takes care of her uh, technical difficulties. Sure. Um, I just want to start by thanking Rabab and Tomomi for inviting me. Um, and also just for having bell hooks as um, the topic in this, um, under this umbrella or in this frame of teaching Palestine. Um, I uh, am heavily influenced by bell hooks. I don't know that I'm quite yet processing uh, her loss or the loss of many others, but um, specifically her in that I was introduced to her early on in my um, feminist sort of teachings or scholarly um, endeavors. I was introduced to her in a women's studies classroom taught by uh, my first black 
professor when I was 20 and it was a class called women racing class. And the first book we read was talking back. Um, and I was really struck by her words in that text and even just the title of the text talking back, because I think it was the first piece that I'd read, um, by a black woman that really sort of centered the intersection of blackness and feminism in a way um, that really made sense to me. And I think part of it was that the language that she used and how she wrote about growing up as a black girl, but um, like the concept of talking back, which just felt like so black to me and later on she talked about fast and being fast girls and those things just felt like such the vernacular and the way that um, black women specifically talk to black young people, something that I knew so familiar growing up, like don't talk back or what does it mean to talk back? Um, that was really important to me that that was part of her theory of feminism and that that was part of her, um, theory in general, right? Um, and I think that it was that kind of language. And then later on, I met her maybe in 1996 when Killing Rage came out. She came again in a student context. I was a student um, at the University of Memphis at the Center for Research on Women. And she came and gave a talk and she spent the day with us and I was so struck by how she talked, like her actual voice. And it was part of that initial frame. Like she just talked like, you know, black women that I knew. And I say that because, you know, I had been reading her for five years at that point, reading books as they came out, um, outlaw culture and black looks and real to real and yearning and all those different works. And, you know, these were works of theory in the ways that we talked about theory. Um, and it just didn't ever, it never struck me that someone could sound like bell hooks and, and write theory, right? Which is the way that theory should be written. But she just sounded like someone, like a black woman that I knew from my childhood. Um, you know, women like Glody and Cookie, she fit right into that. And, and I think I was forever indebted to her for all of that. So I can speak more about what works were important later, but those are some initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Clay. We will come back to talk about that because I was also kind of remembering like what readings I was taught in women's studies and what are were the things that are actually like they're not known in, in, in dominant spaces and so on. So we can talk about that later. I think Professor uh, Margot Kawazare is with us. Okay, go for it. You go next. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, apologies, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, fabulous uh, panel uh, and connecting the work of Bell Hooks to um, Palestine, the situation in Palestine. So um, I guess you could say, you know, Bell Hooks and I were contemporaries. And so um, I, I wasn't influenced, for example, in the ways that um, Andriana was um, as a student, but as um, a young academic um, entering the academy, I was really similar to what um, was said before, I was really impressed by and also felt mixed, you know, because I was uh, just starting as an academic. Can the way she, Bell Hooks is writing be, quote, real scholarship or real academic work? Uh, and, you know, that was my kind of immature way to think about academic work, to think about what it means to be an intellectual. Uh, and um, I've, of course, come to realize that her work and the way she writes, the way she talks about things is exactly um, what we all academics should be striving for in one way, right? And part of that is redefining what is theory, 
redefining what is scholarship, not just uh, conceptually redefining it, but redefining it, you know, through our practice. And I must say that um, her evolution, in a sense, I've kind of paralleled her evolution. So one of her, you know, last works was about love. And in my own um, activism uh, and seeing what's happening in Palestine, in Okinawa, uh, and uh, the Asia Pacific, where there's massive U.S. military based presence, thinking about what it means to be in solidarity as somebody from the dominant country in all those places, right? The U.S. military, U.S. ideology that supports the occupation of Palestine, uh, that um, supports the heavy militarization uh, of um, uh, the uh, Northeast Asia, Philippines, Korea, um, Okinawa, Japan. Um, really thinking about the ways that we really need to think about love. And um, as Hooks talks about, not just in a kind of romantic way, but, you know, love and action, um, and particularly those of us in dominant positions. And to think about not just the kind of uh, intellectual work of uh, being in solidarity, um, but uh, relational practices and solidarity practices that are not just simple kind of methods, and the methods aren't simple, right? But I mean in, in a very um, uh, essential kind of way that whatever we do, right, particularly in these situations of structural inequalities, how do we need to think about love? How do we need to think about as academics, how do we um, teach to transgress so that even people who um, we're in community with, you know, we can say, oh, we're women of color or black women in, in the U.S. How do we become self-critical so that through this process of loving our work, loving our people, loving life indeed, that we can be both self-critical of being attached to the U.S. state, that is wreaking havoc all over the world and be in solidarity uh, with, the, with the people with whom we're structurally in dominant positions. So for me, that's been something that I've been really ruminating about, especially for the last few years. And I'll just stop here for now. Thank you so much, uh, um, Professor Okawazare or Margo, Sister Margo, we go way back. I want to now uh, call on, on the uh, the two Palestinian scholars who are joining us from Palestine. First, we're going to have Professor Samah Saleh from An Najah National University in Nablus, Palestine, and then Professor Amira Silmi from Institute for Women's Studies at Birzeit University, also Palestine. We are so honored and so happy that you are able to join us and connect Palestine with the resistance of intellectual uh, silencing uh, on this show. So let's move on to Fer Samah and then Amira, please. Uh, thank you, Rabab, for the invitation and thank you for uh, like this interesting uh, discussion and uh, listening to all these experiences. Um, so for me, um, I, I have like I unfortunately, of course, I could I didn't meet uh, Bill Hooks, but um, the first time I uh, heard about her or uh, knew about her work, I was complaining about uh, teaching, about students, and about uh, this kind of dynamics inside the class. And one of my friends, uh, while I was doing my PhD, introduced me to uh, Bill, Hock, uh, uh, Bill Hock's work, uh, teach, Teaching to Transgress. And um, this was kind of... Uh, um, something stopped me a lot and something that changed a lot of uh, my thoughts and then i start i, I will talk about it later on but um, the thing that for me as a researcher uh, I, and i have focus on uh, palestinian women uh, political prisoners um i start to um, learn about uh, 
the way that she was looking into women, like the idea of victims and the, that women are not victims and that the, uh, using this discourse uh, to victimize women and uh, um, talking about the patriarchy and all this kind of uh, thoughts, like attract me because she's uh, this she was against this kind of discourse uh, of looking into women as victims that because it takes uh, their power and that um, uh, and she believed that women have this kind of uh, political uh, she they have the ability to take to 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 participate and to take decision and to uh, have this power to control their lives somehow um, so uh, this is kind of the uh, political solidarity among women and um, this was really interesting for me to look into this and then I start to learn also about her interest on and her discourse around the, um, uh, the, the everyday life and this helped me a lot to articulate my, my research and my work uh, around uh, to understand the hegemony that women confront on their everyday life. And for me, it was kind of very interesting to look at her work because it was very kind of easy to read and easy to understand. And it was easy to build these links with the Palestinian women and um, the, the, uh, the idea of living in this, uh, in this context. And for me, as, as a woman and as uh, like working on um, having all this kind of, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, labels, women, I'm, I'm a refugee, and then I'm now in this kind of uh, uh, working with women who are less documented, and uh, they don't have uh, um, uh, the, the space to, this, to talk about themselves or to, ex to share their experiences as political prisoners, she kind of gave me this um, windows to look into uh, different aspects. So this is how I start to become interested in her work and her uh, research and her theories. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Samah. Uh, and you know, like every time somebody speaks, I'm sure all of us have thousands of questions, but we have to be disciplined. So I'm going to turn over to uh, Professor Amira Silmi from Institute for Women's Studies at Birzeit University. Please go. You're muted. Unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry again. Uh, hi, all. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's great to participate in something that Hooks have been calling for in most of her writings, that conversation between uh, women of color, uh, emphasizing that feminism is actually for everyone and is not uh, uh, confined to a few privileged uh uh, white woman uh, uh, from the middle class. And actually, this was my uh, main encounter with uh, Bell Hooks. It was in 2004 when I was starting to work on my MA dissertation in gender studies on uh, the struggle of Palestinian women, their anti colonial struggle. And then I discovered that actually I cannot speak about uh, Palestinian women or write their stories and their struggle because it has been already written, it has all uh, been already represented. And uh, uh, I either have the option of repeating what is said or not, uh, not write. And this is where writers, uh, black uh, women writers and other third world feminists were uh, uh came to my rescue actually to uh to actually question that position of the representative that uh the colonization that uh western feminism has uh uh perpetrated let's say against other women that are less privileged that uh, thought uh unable to represent uh, themselves or to speak on uh, their own behalf uh 
but, but what is special about Bell Hooks as well is not only her uh, criticism of uh, what she called uh, reformist uh, or liberal uh, feminism, but also that she would not let go of feminism, that feminism is a, uh, a theory of liberation, a way of being, and a different way of being, a, a way to construct something else. Uh, and not just a critique or uh, a place where we can uh, whine or uh, cry uh, or weep, uh, but something that we can, uh, as women, uh, do and fight for. And so her no notion of a militant feminism, a feminism that is uh, willing to confront and challenge uh, patriarchy that it cannot be separated from capitalism or imperialism, that uh, all come together in her really long formulation of the imperialist, uh, white supremacist, uh, capitalist patriarchy. And it is something that is, uh, that here in Palestine, when women confront all these uh, forms of oppression, that that makes bell hooks somebody who's very relevant uh, to, uh, to our lives. Thank you so much. And thank you all for this. I was wondering if, uh, Professor Kinakawa, you want to, you have like some uh, maybe commentary on this before we move to the next round and you are, okay, you're moderating the next round. So I'm stepping away. Unmute. Uh, sorry. You were still muted. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Could you hear me now? I'm awfully sorry. Um, so I just was thinking um, for all these um, amazing narratives, and like it's just um, it's just amazing that um, to I mean that and the, this the history of transnational feminist solidarity is right here, um, and um, it's just so much privilege to be listening to all these stories, and um, so and. I think I'd like to actually move on to the next question. I, can I wait until later to share my thoughts? Um, it's because it's still going, I mean, I am still um, like um, digesting what I, I just list, just heard, so um, pardon me. And um, so I think I'd like to um, go to the next round. And um, so that question, yeah, the, so um, the, all the readings that uh, the panel, panelists um, at the, uh, agreed to like uh, select the readings that um, um, from Bell Hooks, um, like 40 some books, and um, and um, the, we shared with our students the list of recommended works. And so the next round, I'd like um, each panelist, uh, we're asking each panelist to speak about those uh, readings and um, the, yeah, your thoughts and critiques. And so, um, could, so I'm, um, who would you like to go first? Could we go around the same order or? Um, I, I don't think so. we can do a reverse order or somebody was, I was actually maybe thinking like, even though Amira finished, maybe Amira could start here, speak into and maybe um, Andriana can speak about it again, and then the other other people can just jump in and decide how would you would like to do it. I, I think we can each turn, we can do it differently. It's OK. So I was just putting maybe people on the spot, if that's OK. Do you mind going first, Amira? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh... Uh, so I, I, I teach, I, I teach uh, this selected reading, the feminism for everybody, and uh, a course about family. Uh, I was looking for texts that uh, emphasize feminist ethics and different ways of being and doing. I was looking for things about love and care and uh, women's own values, or the, uh, or let's say another uh, values from another culture going with actually socialist feminism. But uh, Bell Hook's book stood out. And 
what was uh, really important, other than her you know, uh, interventions on marriage, love, children's education, violence, and work, was uh, also her theorization of questions of sisterhood and the importance of collective work. So uh, 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 while we, in, in the course we read Delphi, Delphi he, uh, in, in that article declaring men and man as the main enemy and not unwilling to see the problem in the system, uh, in sexism or patriarchy, or patriarchy is man and man is patriarchy. And this is where bell hooks is so very relevant because bell hooks is going to tell Delphi actually it's not necessarily domestic work, it could be actually productive work and uh, exploitation in the uh, market for uh, working class women is something that is as oppressive or more oppressive than the oppression or, uh, well, well, at some point, Hawks would not even agree to use the word oppression to describe the relationship and that, or the, the, let's say, the subjection that women uh, uh, experience in the uh, suburban women, Friday uh, women experience in really when, when they choose not to see uh, the oppression and exploitation that working class women and black women uh, who usually combine both as well, uh, and the same applies to colonized women, or the, the most of them, uh, uh, experience. And so uh, it, for me, it's very important that my students, when they read Delphi, and then they, they do read socialist feminists who emphasize class, but then with Hawks, it's not only class, it's also race. You cannot be a feminist without talking race and class. You cannot be a feminist without questioning patriarchy instead of seeking to have a place within the patriarchal system to become a man uh, or another man who dominates others. And so uh, uh, this is why I think you know, uh, in, in most of my uh, courses, if I have to talk feminism, then uh, bell hooks needs to be there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amira. Andriana, do you mind going next? No, um, I can go. Um, I think that uh, the pieces that I maybe recommended I, are, were Black Looks and Outlaw Culture. Um, and I chose these because I really like the way uh, that Bell Hooks focuses on popular culture and how Black people in particular are represented in popular culture. And I think that was something that always spoke to me as part of kind of the post-civil rights or Generation X or whatever it was, like the place that many of my, you know, friends at school or people that I knew who were not Black, the places that they understood and interacted with blackness was really through popular culture, either through music or like Cosby, you know, the Cosby show uh, was really popular at the time. And that's where people understood blackness. So I really appreciated that she um, interrogated that so fully and from all these different, you know, vantage points and kept putting it in the forefront. And I think you know, we can still talk about that now, like her sort of in-depth critique and and um, how did she, she, she took it seriously, um, popular culture. And I think now it's relevant in this whole moment of cancel culture or, you know, and sort of the, the lens that we still have on black popular culture, especially as it relates to social movements and activism right now, it's really useful to go back to Bell Hooks and in the ways that she was so skilled about it and did it in such an in-depth way that I think is missing in this moment that we could really benefit from that kind of rereading because it is so um, important as a critique of racism, but also in understanding how to use feminism 
more expansively, which is what she always did. You know, it is this white supremacist, heteronormative, patriarchal culture. Um, and it's not limited to just sexism, although sexism was really where she came in. So, so okay, so we're thinking about maybe uh, next we will, uh, is it okay to turn to you, Margot? And maybe speak about the connection of, uh, you know, that uh, you were one of the authors of the Kompahi River Collective. No, I was not one of the authors. No. Oh, you yes. did No. Okay. But anyway, um, let me just say a couple of things I think is really uh, important. And that is, um, yes, I respect, you know, Bell Hooks's work a lot. Uh, and I have over the years. Um, I think like many academics, feminists, activists in the US, where I find um, what I wish she had done more of, uh, and you know, um, and, and this is with all due respect, is really thinking about mm, transnational feminism and thinking about, and from that, the lens of transnational feminism, you know, um, how might we think about the critical importance of our relationship, our meaning people in the US with US citizenship, et cetera, paying taxes to this government? How must we think critically about our relationship to the state and therefore our relationship to people with whom we're in solidarity? And I see this every time I go to Palestine, I was there you know, in the, um, November and December, um, you leave, I leave there thinking, okay, things can't get any worse. But then I realize that things have gotten much worse than I could have imagined, uh, including just finding out after I came back that we are, we are not allowed bank to bank to transfer money to um, any banks in the, uh, in the West Bank. And that's a fairly recent um, decision, right? And so that's one thing. And the other along also the, these lines is, you know, also really thinking about blackness, like, um, and this is where the connection of being connected to the U.S. popular culture, U.S. media, all those things, even though, even though on the one hand, we're on the margins here in the States, when you think about which blackness travels and which doesn't, I think it's really something that, um, we black feminists need to think about. So um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, we were going to go, Beverly, is that okay to jump into either speak about your selection or yeah, go ahead, please. And then Trisha. Hi, Beverly. <laughs> Beverly, you're muted. I'm mute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm terrible. I'm a zero. Uh, hey, Margo. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember what uh, reading. I think I sent videos, but but, but what I do want to talk about, what, what book I would have uh, mentioned, uh, which none of us, I think, has mentioned, is The Will to Change, Man, Masculinity, mm -hmm. and Love. And I, 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 I need to say this. One of the things that I have to share with my students, my students, and maybe that's true, but don't understand that feminism was a dirty word. They also mm -hmm. don't understand that being an out black feminist, and Margaret, you know this, being an out black feminist early on was to locate you in a demonic space. You were perceived to be anti-black. You were perceived to be uh, anti-male. You were perceived to be lesbian, which of course was a horrible thing to be. You were perceived to be angry. And so, one of the one of the uh, uh, reasons that Combahee and people like Bell Hooks and others of us out black feminists got in trouble is not because we criticized white women or because we criticized uh, uh, patriarchy in general. It's when we turn the gaze on our own racial ethnic communities. That's that's what got us in trouble. And so one of the things that people didn't like about Bell Hooks, among many other things, is she talked about that she, she, she understood what patriarchy was within her family because she grew up with a patriarchal 
uh, abusive, not physically abusive fathers. She said, I didn't learn my, I didn't learn about patriarchy from white women and I didn't learn about uh, heteropatriarchy somewhere else. It was my lived experience, mm -hmm. but she was very committed, very committed to helping men get rid of their toxic masculinity traits and to distance themselves from patriarchy. And she brought a lot of men into the in, 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 into the space. I mean, I, I can just remember going to many, many gatherings and the audience had as many men as women. That was very unusual. And one of the things that she criticized the so-called white women's movement for was not understanding how important it is to get men to distance themselves from patriarchy. So uh, that's one of the reasons I really like her um, masculinity book. Thank you. It, it's this is a quite a luxury to be able to have this um, very transnational, um, you know, composite of folks and doing such an intimate discussion. Um, I want to just uh, say one thing. You know, thinking along what Margot says, Bell probably would say, Margot, that's the work. You know, you you know you are out there that. Go do it. And in fact, Belle is the one that constantly, uh, in all, almost all her works and talks, um, she, as someone called, would, would label her as a postmodern cultural critic. Uh, in a way, I actually think that she is such a critical thinker. She is constantly um, breaking down this very rigid military uh, patriarchal binaries. You know, between theory, practice, local, global, and she, mm -hmm. she writes and tells us she, 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 in many places she, she reminds us that the the a, a very good place to do the work is local, being who you are, you know, doing the uh, the activist work. So um, I want to say teaching to transgress is one text I use. I, I, I don't use the whole book. I you I wish I could use the whole book and I'm gonna challenge myself to use a whole book next time for sure. And and including um I still find um her uh, film theory from margin to center a book that is almost 40 years old that is still very very you know still relevant. In fact in 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 the one conversation she she responded that said I wish I were I would you know uh, I, I would date it by now, but the fact I'm still not right. A lot of her thoughts are still so relevant. So uh, teaching to transgress, you know, uh, theory as a liberatory practice. Mm -hmm. uh, too many of our students in the classroom coming to a coming to theory trembling. Right, this is a like you know language. She brings it down to the personal. The personal is political. The personal is the is critical, um, and she's never afraid of um, using some of the words that we would call a fuzzy. You know, uh, it, it, well, what's the word? The uh, the touchy feely words like a yearning. Um, you know, uh, feeling love, love, right? And love. In fact, I, I would say, um, I, I would just want to read out that uh, how her first sentence, uh, first paragraph to uh, almost all my student, students uh, is just like, um, you know, my shifting in terms of theory. And I opened the class, you know, feminine theory and practice with, with that sentence. And I... Um, let me see if I can just quickly bring it, and I'm sure it's here. Uh, so I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanted to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. Most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away. I saw in theory then a location for healing. And she goes on, the, the chapter is really worth revisiting again and again. And she goes on to say, 
that um, for in the for in its production lies the hope theory that is lies the hope of our liberation. In its production lies the possibility of naming all our pain, of making our hurt go away. We create feminist theory, feminist movements that address this pain. We will have no difficulty building a mass feminist resistance struggle. There will be no gap between feminist theory and feminist practice. And I also want to add quickly just to say, I thought long and hard, if bell hooks were a white woman, just imagine having published 40 plus books, I mean, how she would be received. To me, it's astounding there's no bell hooks reader today. And it's also astounding to me that um, my colleagues would, I, I mean, I'm challenging my, myself and my colleagues to really turn this whole year, year of bell hooks. We, doesn't matter what we teach. Computer science, we teach bell hooks. You know, art, we teach bell hooks. So um, I would say uh, just in her spirit that uh, she is a teacher, that she will always live among us. Beverly put it wonderfully in her interview with Emily, uh, Amy Goodman. She said, Bev, uh, Bell was a teacher and is a teacher. You know, her book, um, it's probably less mentioned, less read, um, a teaching community, a pedagogical hope. In so many ways, it sums up, you know, she, her reach is wide, even though in academia, she might be sort of put, as Margot said, that people looked at her suspect, her language is not academic, but, but her reach is incredible. Students actually, they come to feminism a lot of times thanks to bell hooks. And I'll just mention this one one anecdote and I'll let our uh, my next colleague to go. Um, in one WGS 100 course, introduction course, one student, uh, one young black woman came to, my, came to my office before the first class and, and said to me, I want to, my name is so-and-so, and I want to be the bell hook of my generation. Hmm. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Trisha. Uh, some, uh, some... So, um, I was thinking that sometimes I wish I read uh, uh, many of the theories, uh, complicated theories like Freire or uh, Freud, like I read uh, Hooks because it's kind of uh, easy to understand. It's uh, easy to uh, get connection with her. So I think she speaks to the heart of uh, to the heart of education today, because uh, this is how um, we how can we uh, rethink of teaching practices. And then what do we do about teachers, uh, our, about ourselves, and how can we get uh, our students to be attracted to what we teach? And this is kind of this dynamics and this power relation. I think it's very important for us as teachers to, to, to read her, to understand her work and to learn from her, for, from her work. For me, teaching to transgress because it changed a lot of my thoughts about me being in, in a classroom or being in the university among this kind of very masculine uh, space and um, with this hegemony, with with her thoughts and her passion of uh, around teaching and the, the, the she and how she combines practical knowledge of the classroom with deeply uh, like feelings and emotions. This is the thing that uh, um, I think this book, um, the teaching uh, to transgress, is 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 a book that I keep visiting because it gives me the courage to continue and to to rethink about uh, the classroom, about this kind of space that is uh, full of uh, this hegemony and this uh, power relationship. So for our next round, I'm passing it over to my colleague, 
Dr. Tomo Mikenakawa to, to conduct the round. Sure. Um, so our, um, thank you so much um, for all the panelists. I'm like, um, I actually now have, have a burning question, but um, I think let's go to the round three. Um, so um, is so the our questions were, is it important to teach Belfix? Why and how? And how does teaching Belfix link to other curriculums we select for our classrooms? And how do students uh, respond and relate to the material? And um, so did we decide which order do we want to go this time? Um, And you, I mean, I think, yeah, please take, I um, mean, take it away. Um. Okay, I'll, I'll say something right quick. Um, I, I have found that showing, showing bell hooks in action, showing those interviews and she, in the tunnel, uh, the students are spellbound because, you know, there's this soft voice. <laughs> And, 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 and she's so accessible and, and she feels like someone, I think Andriana, you said this. So I start in my class with showing, uh, with showing her uh, in addition to the readings. And I, and I, and I think, and now we've got so, we've got so many. So I, I begin with that and, 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 and that compels them to really want to read more and more and more and more. So I really think that the showing the visuals the interviews is just really, really powerful with the readings. And they, and, 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 you know, one of the, the first thing I say to my students is she wrote her first book as an undergraduate. They are, they are stunned. She wrote her first feminist theory book as an undergraduate, 19 years old, and they are stunned their mouths fall. So in other words, de deconstruct this notion of who can theorize. And then when they <laughs> see th this, you know, small, soft-spoken, powerful, uh, person, they are they are just mesmerized. <laughs> Can someone repeat the question again? Sorry. Sure. Um, the questions are, um, I think, um, is it important to teach Belfux? Why and how? And how does teaching Belfix link to other curriculums we select for our classrooms? And how do students respond or relate to the material? Um, I can repost it. In the... um, if I may, I'm going to... Uh, I think, Beverly, you're absolutely right. The visual and the juxtaposing, pairing, that is pairing, the reading with a... Uh, uh, well speaking, you no, know, her, and and she, she is really really accessible, and I think academia really needs to rethink its own language. Frankly, I was just say that um, the question, the first the first question is rhetorical, right? Of course, it's important to teach bell hooks, but do we teach bell hooks? Do we all teach bell hooks? If I really check around, I I, I can be probably say bell hook shows up in probably mostly um, faculty of colors uh, syllabus in WGS, but I'm not so sure. Maybe one or two other colleagues would do it. Um, so she becomes that sort of um, omnipresent reference people would talk about, but not taught, not read really in class proper. And I think we, um, I, I would like to um, to encourage that we do that. Teaching bell hooks is teaching teaching a radical women of color's work, radical black women's work. And it's teaching still brave, right? Um, you know, all the women are white, uh, all the blacks are men, but some of us still brave. And, and really her work came out of that whole uh, the time, even though, her work was not uh, included in the, the reading, but I look at her work really embodies that 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 you know still brave uh, you know uh, radical black women um, thinking, and 
teaching her is so important because she's constantly pushing everyone, pushing herself as well. In, I, I recall in this one interview, she she her response was that she couldn't quite tell because she reads a book, she read a book a day or two books a day, and she couldn't really and and these books would change her, so she couldn't offer a response. So the way that she well, this is definitely uh, we we all read in the um, feminist theory from margin to center. She talked about feminism itself is almost like a vehicle. We can actually push it, advocate. So advocate feminism and demanding redefinition. So I think, you know, um, I would say teaching bell hooks is teaching Beverly, teaching Gombahi uh, River Collective, teaching Angela Davis, teaching uh, Palestinian feminist struggles. It's really indivisible. I, I really see it's uh, important and I am locally doing this work with all my colleagues um, around um, um, the state here and and um, we're so happy that you know so honored that Beverly will be speaking in one of the one of the series of uh, the you know the year of uh, celebrating Bell hooks on March 24th so stay tuned <laughs> So well, I Beverly, just, I, oh, go oh, ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrea. Uh, I will just say quickly that it's interesting just thinking about it. Like our department, uh, quite a few faculty, including myself, start out with engaged pedagogy um, from teaching to transgress as a way to sort of open whatever subject it is in sociology or sexuality studies. Um, and we've done that for a long time, but it's interesting. I don't think I did it this semester, um, which is interesting after, you know, months after she passed. Um, and just in reflecting, there is a way that I forget um, about bell hooks sometimes beyond um, engaged pedagogy. And I think it kind of goes back to that discussion around academia and voice and theory and what we're supposed to put on the syllabus. And so it is something, just this conversation. And then when I remember that I have forgotten something I want to think more about and sort of where, especially her later works um, to place her, because I think there is a way we can insert her discussions around love. And as other people have said, um, black men and masculinity, there was the book on cool, um, yeah. that I think can be inserted in all these different places. Beverly, um, this is a conversation about you and me, actually. So tell me <laughs> if this, if I'm correct or not. You know, it, I think if you put this uh, Bell Hooks work historically, I think there was a time when Bell Hooks's work was just one of very few Black women's works that were included in Intro to Women's Studies yeah. textbooks. True. And, and, Audrey, and Audrey Lord, the two of them. And Audrey Lord, right, those two. <laughs> but I, I, but Bell Hooks in particular was, her stuff was, you know, recycled over and over again in Intro to Women's Studies textbooks. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if part of the reason was that she was not thought about by white women academics as a serious academic, you know, and in that sense, um, well, let's like a token. She was used as a token because they didn't really understand the power of her work. I agree. And I'm agree. just throwing that as a question, Beverly. I mean, you and I go way back in, way back. you know, women and gender studies. So, and I, and I, I discovered too. this when um, I, um, in the first edition of uh, what is now Gendered Lives, the Intro to Women's Studies textbook that came out in 1997, co-edited with Gwen Kirk. When we did a review of all the intro books, the one consistent author, black woman author was Bell Hooks. And we were like, why? She's not the only you know, person theorizing, right? So no, I anyway, I just want to throw that in the mix. It just made me remember. I, I, 
I absolutely agree with you, Margaret. The other thing I would say is if you if you think about queer theory, Audre Lorde is never in queer theory uh, readers. She was she's not perceived to be a queer theorist. We consider her to be a, a, a feminist theorist and a queer theorist, but she's not even even when Audre Lorde was thrown into those intro readers like Bell, she was not considered to be a theorist. So yes, both of them. Right. And just a rhetorical question for all of us is, you know, who is a theorist? What is a theory, right? And it seems to me that's a fundamental question that Bell Hooks challenges us to think about, but also to teach Bell Hooks. I think we have to learn and rethink what theory is. And we have to rethink who we are, right? As a teacher, as a learner in the context of teaching. If I may, can I say one thing that, um, Beverly, you mentioned that Audrey Law is not in the queer, um, any of the queer anthologies. And, you know, in the same breath, uh, while, you know, if you go, go, go to uh, Wikipedia, so, some, somehow someone label a Bell as a postmodern critic. You open any postmodern readers, you do not, not see, no, it's not there. When she should be right there, you know, at the center. Could, could I just say in that regard, and, and this, this gets back to Margot, uh, we're much more accepted as writers. And I think that when Bell Hooks was put in those, she's like, like Audrey, they're considered to be writers, but not theorists. Can I, okay. can I say something here? Actually, I would call her a writer and I would refuse. Okay, I'm not, I have nothing against theory and actually Hooks does talk about theory and what theory means. But again, Bell Hooks is someone who changes what theory means and how do we do theoretical work? And she actually challenges that binary between the theory and practice, the theoretical and the everyday life. She's calling for uh, actually uh, dismantling that binary and she does it in her own work. I agree, Margot, actually that, yeah, uh, there's some kind of iconization of uh, Bell Hooks. I, I, I would have thought more than Audrey Lorde but I, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah, I, I do agree. But that that actually it's it's some that way that the, I'm sorry for the expression. Maybe it's not the most politically correct, but it is the American way or uh, again to quote uh, Bell Hooks, the patriarchal capitalist way of incorporating the different the uh, the uh, rebellious uh, voice, the voice that uh, mm -hmm. would not go with the standardized and normalized. Uh, that's that is one way to turn um, Bell Hooks herself not as uh, part of a collective of a black woman, but actually her own individual uh, self, and it's only a case, an individual case. And I, I think. Bell Hooks, in her writings, she was uh, uh, defying that. She wasn't really uh, allowing herself to be incorporated. I, in, in, for for me, for when I when I teach Bell Hooks or Audrey Lord, actually, it's always the same. Uh, that same wonderful reaction from students. There is that link. There is that commonality. Uh, we struggle, and I agree with your uh, question, Margo, also that in, in, in Bell Hooks, you don't find that direct uh, questioning of uh, the Black feminist position from the state. Uh, there's critique, there's a lot of critique of the social system, sometimes of the political uh, practices, but uh, uh, call for a, a, an anti-imperialist position, but still, uh, that her writing, that her texts are that relevant, that they do resonate, that people here, they do understand them. And it's not only on an intellectual level that they are understood by our students. There is that deeper, uh, I, I'll, I'll go with Samak, that emotional uh, level, which I think is more real, actually, to say, oh, I, I do agree with you, but nothing goes inside. No, I think with Audrey Lord, with Toni Morrison, and with uh, Bell Hooks, things 
I, I'll call it bachelor art here. They go inside and then they go back to the consciousness or to the intellectual part of ourselves. And, and they think this is more important. And so even if she's being iconized, that doesn't take much of the influence and the power of her work. Um, and as I, I, as I said, I, I teach her also in uh, the history of feminism course for my undergraduate students. And what's always the fun part for me, that any yani, moment of feeling power, is that Dryden's voice is not the only feminist voice that always that liberal reformers uh liberate yourself women that uh, that or we're all we're in an era of post-feminism actually no bell hooks is that feminist who would write a different history of feminism not only for any third world women but in in the us itself that she always tells us that the history of feminism is not one history that is the history of the middle class why uh, feminist, and this is why bell hooks is always there. That that history is not dominated or written only by one voice. Uh, so yeah. I'm not sure if Samah um, you didn't say anything. I would like to say something after. Okay. So I I'm, I actually wanted to kind of like go back to a couple of few points that folks have said. One is uh, when we started speaking, Beverly, you spoke about, you mentioned 1981, you mentioned Barbara Smith, you mentioned uh, Audrey Lord, you mentioned, and, and throughout we're talking, I've been invoking multiple names, Bell Hope, Audrey Lord, uh, um, Angela Davis, and so on. So I was actually thinking about one is the whole question of the international transnational, that a lot of the times also, uh, bell hooks also, uh, bell hooks and other black feminists actually are put within sort of like the domesticated US scene. So it becomes the relationship between what happens within uh, feminist theory in particular spaces and the, it's not even the US state sometimes, sometimes it's actually with white feminists or white supremacist feminists or white liberal feminists and so on. So the international link, the transnational link, the connections that have always existed and that continue to exist a lot of the times they kind of disappear. And so there it becomes the efficacy of whatever is quote unquote domestic and whatever is foreign. And sort of like reinforcing borders and boundaries that I think it's also a political project. It's not, it's not an accidental project and it's not uh, isolated. It's a political project to make it, to domesticate and separate and isolate. That's one issue. The second question issue I was thinking about is the ways in which um, um, bell hooks, yes, sometimes sort of like is used in a way that becomes sort of innocent, it's innocentizing or disarming or sort of like not threatening. And we're going and sub that there is a choice of certain things that, that she talks about, but other things are not talked about at all. I mean, kind of like this whole radical impulse, the subver subversiveness, the challenging of the system and so on. So I think that's kind of like something that it reminds me a lot of several uh, uh, writings about uh, multiple, and especially not only by in the in the U.S. but elsewhere, in the other in the other parts of the world, the ways in which women get represented as sort of childlike, and innocent, and disarming, and in order for us to be able to draw sympathies and solidarities, it's not on the basis. And you said angry. You mentioned angry, Beverly, when you were saying, it's not on the basis of being actually angry and being subversive and defined and saying, there's something wrong with the system and we really need to challenge it as one, but to present it as something that might be safe to present what is acceptable and, and swallowable and so on. And so the last the, the, the last point that I've been thinking about it in, the, in terms of like the various spaces that we're teaching within and outside of the classroom. So when we're talking about what does this matter, and also if somebody is going to come to us and say, why is this so relevant to my life? Why is this really so important and so on? And then we talk about what happens with, let's say, with the Women's March and the purging of women of color, of Palestinian women. What happens with the big attack at the International Women's Strike? What's been happening again and again? And, and how, for example, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and well, less AOC and to that extent, were also constructed as sort of don't belong, go back to your 
SH countries and so on. So I'm thinking about the ways in which all of these things play out in our particular spaces. So then what does this really mean for us to do this within the academy? And what does this mean to do this outside of the academy? When the onslaught is coming from outside and, on, and inside, and the, and the academic onslaught is always asking, so what's so relevant about this? How is this really feminist? How is this really intellectual? How, so we're saying, well, we want to defy the theory uh, praxis uh, divide. We want to defy what's feminist, what's not. We want to defy who's a writer, who's an intellectual. Well, nobody ever questions if Foucault is an intellectual. But everybody sometimes questions that. Is Bill Hook an intellectual? Why is there even a question about that? Why the question gets raised? And then how do we put all these contradictory texts together? That there isn't agreement. So there isn't an agreement a lot of the times about how Audre Lorde sees something or Barbara Smith. Or, or, or Angela Davis, or Bell Hooks, or how all the various scholars that we talk about and our, and the, the heroes and the sheroes and, and the non-heroes and the non heroes and we think about also gender and so on. How do we think about all of this stuff? And how do we think about it when the academy, and I remember Amira, when we were doing Teaching Palestine, you and Bir Zaid for were one, some of the people who said, we really need to talk about the neoliberal, neoliberalism with the academy and how funding and how the trans, quote, unquote, transfer of knowledge and how what is seen as respectable, what is not respectable, is there. So what does this really mean to actually have a call for subversion, for resistance, for changing, not only to modify or reform the system, but to actually really kind of like try to alter it altogether? Um, I just want to say that um, I, I always try to put like text for my students for Bill Hawk, or Hawks or any any, any other uh, like things, but but unfortunately most of our students here they don't speak really a good English. So the question is that there is a need here for translation for this kind of text because it is really important for 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 them to rethink and to to start understanding what's going on uh, around them and the thing that uh, like come to my mind how uh, Hawks thinks about women that they are not all uh, uh, similar and how this kind of uh, their position uh, and their ethnicity and the class that produce different uh, life experience for them according to their position in this kind of uh, hegemony and uh, how it uh, um, like how this kind of discourse is missing from the analyzing for the uh, ethnic ethnicity and the uh, uh, feminist discourse. Um, so this kind of brought, I think, uh, women in color to the um, uh, to the um, uh, idea of uh, uh, to be part of the feminist movement and uh, that been led always by white uh, uh, feminist. So this is kind of the idea that she gave women the space and the voice inside the uh, feminist uh, uh, movement by like highlighting uh, lights on their everyday lives and uh, their positionality as a women. So I think this is kind of very important for, for for students, for us also to rethink about our um, about our position, about our thoughts as 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 academic and as as women. So, mommy, you wanted to say something? Yeah. yeah so, in response to, I think actually everyone like um, I'm just thinking that like you know, Bill Fix as like a considered to be domesticated, and I'm just thinking that. Like when I critique Japanese colonialism, Japanese imperialism, I feel like our critique of that is pretty domesticated, like considered to be very much domesticated, like it doesn't go beyond that particular um, you know, region or like a um, place. And um, and then I feel that when this so and so domesticated theories actually, when we get to share those each other, that really is powerful. <laughs> And then I'm just thinking like uh, like what um, I think uh, Margot was saying, like um, 
all these these theories like about Fuchs and also J. Lord and many others, like um I mean everyone here, like when those are like uh, carried um like uh, beyond these I don't know regional boundaries, they are kind of branded and like packaged by white imperialist feminists, right? Like and so the it's not there's not necessarily the direct like um conversations that have been possible in that sense. And so so I'm just thinking that um it's it's still I, I feel like there's so much like and then when I read like Bill Fuchs and uh, I mean, all of years work in the context of critique of Japanese colonialism and imperialism it so helpful and like that 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 I mean like I don't mean to like I mean I mean so and there's so much more like you know like um that we can do um and also I think the other way around too like like where are the domesticated theories which like a US based scholars are not necessarily getting in the ways in which they were uh, presented and like uh, written um so so that was my question can i quickly say um bell hooks was very aware for, for, first of all uh she claimed the identity intellectual very few very few and that's not a identity that particularly women of color are able to claim I mean, she calls herself an intellectual. She also was very aware of the ways in which within African-American intellectual history, she was not there. Okay. And, and I'm going to say that she was almost not read in African-American studies courses. So people know Bell Hooks, as limited as women's studies was, they know her primarily if they took a women's studies course. So she, she at least was there, but she was very aware you, you could take a whole course on African-American political thought or African-American intellectual, whatever, and we knew, know who was there, all the men, <laughs> starting with Du Bois and just coming all the way up to Cornell and blah, blah, blah. And she knew she was not in that uh, uh, canon. And that's that's the canon we need to also put her in because yeah. she's in the women's studies canon, but she's not in the, in the uh, African-American studies canon. And this is considering that... Um... She co-wrote a book with Cornell. Yes. And still not considered. No. No. And may I also um so we're talking Tomomi brought up the uh the, the Japanese imperialist context and um you know uh Sama and Amira talked about the uh the, the Palestinian context. Uh, while I have lived away from my my homeland, uh, Taiwan, um, definitely you could say another, um, you know, um, capitalist Mandarin supremacist, um, hetero patriarchal space. Uh, there is, I want to say, in that cultural context, um, gradually. Black women or black black writers' work, it you know has been introduced gradually, um, but the uh, the introduction is very uneven. Um, last December, when news of uh, Bell's passing sort of just went around, going viral in the uh, internet sphere, um, I uh, one young uh, feminist of a Taiwan feminist just approached me to say, I'm just shocked. I've never heard of her. Right? You you may read Toni Morrison, you may read Alice Walker. Um but the the curriculum um by and large in spaces like Taiwan still mirror a very white uh mutual patriarchal production. It's very shocking, and, and of course, not surprising. But I would just say there's a way. There's so much more work to be done in terms of a transnationalizing uh, black intellectual, public intellectual, uh, such as bell hooks.
So I think we have a little time left and maybe people can go around and maybe can't. There is no question. So maybe every every person can just like make a couple of minutes of uh, concluding um, course, concluding remarks, whoever would like to. So no, there is no closure. This is not the end. This is just an opening conversation, but yeah. Go ahead, Beverly. You're okay. Uh, uh, I, I spent, um, before Bell Hooks died, I uh, visited her three times in the last month. And w one of the things that I just want to say is she would be stunned. She would be stunned at the response that she has gotten all over the world. She worried about being forgotten. I mean, I'm getting chill bumps now. She worried about being forgotten. And, and so she would be, I think, so happy today to see this transnational, uh, cross-generational uh, gathering and all of the things that are happening this year. Because she, she, she and, and because you know, she, she, she said, you know, people forgot Zora Neale Hurston. And then, and then Zora had to be uh, resuscitated by Alice Walker. So she would be stunned and happy. And so I believe that, that bell hooks won't be forgotten because I think that w women of color won't let her be forgotten. I think we should just end it with that comment. <laughs> I know. I, Beverly, I have chills over my body just listening to your words. Um, you know, very emotional, frankly. And I will share one uh, little anecdote. Two, I think this is within a few days after her passing. You know, again, everyone was like passing all these love notes of bell hooks. And one of um, one member of this community, uh, you know, sent me this text message to say, today I walked up to our local bookstore. All bell hooks books were gone except one. She got redemption. <laughs> I thought that's a really one, I mean, it's, it's how interesting that redemption is that one title left on the shelf of all Bell's titles there. Um, but I'm, I, if there's anything, I'm, I would just say it's time to read up uh, radical black feminist uh, work. Radical uh, feminist, you know, uh, feminist of color's work not just uh, in the US, but elsewhere as well. That includes our sister Nawa El Sadawi, who recently passed on uh, in August. I, I'm just going to say one thing that maybe Tomomi wants to speak to that, is that for Tomomi and me, actually organizing something like this, opening up this space, it's such a huge sigh of relief and such an amazing labor of love intellectual mm -hmm. it's like you know kind of take some time away from being always in defensive campaigns and you know fighting and so on to actually think about something so productive and to also think what are people going to say what are the surprising things that and we our own conversation like when we start planning and so on we get so excited we know we have so much stuff on our plate and we get so excited okay what are we going to assign our students what are we going to watch how are we reading this what do we think about it so it just like really uh, this this is this is it opens up so many uh, spaces. So I'm I, I think we 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 really want to hear all of you speak. And I think maybe Tomomi needs to like be the last person to speak about this. So I don't know. Uh, I uh, Beverly spoke uh, and uh, Trisha. I don't know if uh, you know uh, Amira, Samah, Andriana, and Margo. You also. We don't have people just are saying this is really great. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, um, I guess I'm leaving this whole thing with a question. And it goes back to Amita's point about iconization and everything. I was thinking, and also to Sama's point about translating the works and things. And I'm thinking, who are the bell hookses, if you will? Uh, at, and they could be 12 years old, 10 years old, whoever, in Palestine, in Taiwan, in Japan, in Korea, right, in East LA, who, and how would we recognize them? And how would we support them to be, to, to really develop their brilliance? Do you know what I mean? And that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking ahead, right? Um, 
who could be the brilliant seers and writers and theorists who would not be recognizable if we looked only with our conventional academic lens. So that's yep. what I'm leaving this conversation with. Great question. I love it. Yeah. I think, you know, speaks to a bell hooks, you know, uh, one of her central concerns is children's well-being, right? I mean, childhood, uh, children. She, she's got, uh, you know, not not necessarily directly, but there are quite a few books that really concern uh, childhood. And the nurturing of a young mind. That's why pedagogy is so, so critical to her, her whole um, intellectual project. Um, call on uh, Samah and Amira and then come back to Andriani. Yeah, for, for me, I, I just want to say uh, thank you for organizing such, such uh, a discussion and, uh, and um, thoughts. It's really like I, now I'm just rethinking how can we, what, 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 what can we do and where we can start from and uh, this is really kind of uh, encouraging to to do something and uh, we always say um, that whoever writes something that is affecting people and uh, uh, leave them to think or to to do something with the work they are not dead because they are lived in their book books different so yeah, this is what I want to say, and thank you for this uh, event. Mira? And I, I think that what Beverly said actually sums all what I may want to say. It, it is that, it, it is, uh, I, I think doing doing this or having this conversation all of us uh even with the question that okay she's domesticated but then we are women from different parts of the world now talking and we're mm -hmm. talking publicly and we're not confined to the academia or in in the university and uh anyone has access to this conversation and we're not limited uh with a certain way of discussing her, we're just, her text is a writing, and we're writing with her, and we're saying things, and we're exchanging ideas with her and about her. And I think this is exactly what uh, her work has been about. I, I was impressed when reading or rereading the book how many times the word collective and women's conversation and women talking together comes up in every single <laughs> article. It seems that is the most important thing for there can be no consciousness when somebody is educating someone. Uh, you don't educate feminism and she says that. You talk it, women talk together and when they talk to come together, when they share experiences uh, without anyone claiming that position of authority, it is then that you have that feminist consciousness that is not limited to a questioning something abstract for patriarchy, but actually questioning any form of domination or oppression. And yes, it starts with women's conversing and talking together. So yeah, thank you for that. Andriana? Um, yeah, I'm just appreciative of being here today. And I do echo Beverly's sentiments um, she is not lost and won't be <laughs> forgotten. I think there's so much more to unpack of this thinker. I mean, that we've talked about her writing 40 books and how, you know, there are eight of us here in this conversation, just her far reach and what we can do with that. So I'm just thankful um, that you put this together and thankful to be on this, Margo and Beverly. I'm New Year work coming in and um, just I'm appreciative of all of our voices and everything everyone has brought. So thank you for putting this together. Can, can I say one more thing since we're a small intimate group that I don't say everywhere. Uh, Bell was at peace 
Belle was at peace knowing that, that her days were short. Mm. And I, 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 I think we should know that, that she was ready at peace and she knew she had done her work. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. That's really Thank great. You. Thank you, Beverly. <laughs> wow. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. That is saying a lot. Good morning. Uh, Just I one second. Yeah. Uh, I simply say, Beverly, thank you for sharing. But she also practiced Buddhism. She yes. had uh, studied with Absolutely. Yes, and in so many ways that she emanates that uh, compassion of the Buddha. Yeah, thank you. And that and that was she wanted to hear that she that was read to her, in in the last oh. week. So I'm very happy you mentioned that. Oh wow! Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to say quickly, like um, like to. I mean, to say that everyone, but uh, like what Robert was saying, that um, like this conversation was made possible by like like by going through so many obstacles, and um, and the fact that we are on this particular um, um, platform, I think, I mean, that's because of the silencing that happened in 2020, and like, and then witnessing what the humongous astronomical amount of labor that Rab Rabab does for this um, for students and community members. Um, I think um, I'm just I feel very privileged and grateful. And so and um, the so I just wanted I mean I think that yeah women I mean like a women queer of color conversation always happens with or does this huge amount of labor behind. So um, I wanted to say that, especially students in my classes, like um, I just wanted to um, ask to remember that labor, so. So we have seven more minutes and usually we like to scrape everything and more. And there was a question from the uh, from the post saying, at what age should we start teaching about bell hooks? Tall children, predominantly children of color, and so on. Does anybody want to like uh, take this on? At what age? And then there was there was also a lingering question about the whole of translation. You know, translation in all sorts of directions, whether it is language, whether it is. Does anybody uh, what would, would like to take that on? I think we'd make record if we stopped when it's like this feels like the energy to stop. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just checking to see if the energy right. is this the energy with everybody. If this is the energy with everybody, we can just stop. Yeah, no. mm. Before we, we head out, I'll just say Bell Hooks also wrote children's books. You know, the, the, she's got books for all ages. Really, I, I, I think that question is a little bit hard to say at what age. You know, if you listen to um, uh, Skin Again or Happy to be Nappy, I mean, it's really for a lot a lot of folks, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Even for adults, I want to say I love to listen to her read Happy to be Nappy. Be Nappy, yeah. Yeah. I'm just stepping back to see if any of you wants to take on this question before we close. Somebody asked, so one final question, where do we go from here? If we look back in a year, in five years, don't, let's not get uh, hung up on the time, but where do we go from here? I see, um, uh, Andriana, do you feel like you want to say something? Um, no, I'm kind of concerned about our panelists sisters in Palestine who are up late, but that's kind of right. 
midnight there. No, so it's not Amira, do you want to say something before we close? Okay. Yeah. Um, but I don't have anything else to add. I think rest is good. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can I You're just good? say, be bell hooks, be fierce, be feminist, be bold, be radical. You know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to take it from here, let's keep on. Yes, yeah, yeah, I go with Tricia. I, 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 I think that uh, I was really impressed to, to keep reading about radical feminism, radical feminists. <laughs> People gave up on these and she's not giving up. And it, it, it is empowering actually to, uh, to have this belief that feminism is something that we still need to have and, uh, and to keep redefining. And, you know, radicals, the radicals were in the 70s, but bell hooks kept talking and quoting the radicals. They are still relevant. She's telling us, don't let the neoliberal feminists take over. They are the radicals and they're needed. And so, yes, if we want, where do we go from here? I think we go back to radical politics, collective radical politics. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will say, I guess, in, in Tomomi's name and my name, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. Thank you so much, Amira and Samar, for coming in so late at night and being able to participate. Thank you, Ebu. The Really, you're, you're like vanguard, if I may use this word, figures of the movement for liberation, for justice, for justice for all not only around feminism and queer liberation, but for everybody, for justice for all. And uh, thank you. We hope everybody has enjoyed and learned about it. We hope our students will participate and uh, comment on it. And we will be seeing you hopefully sometime in the future, maybe in Palestine, uh, yes. when we are able to travel and connect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.